Okay, welcome uh, to our session, uh, Networking for Information Integrity in Asia and Globally. Um, thank you for joining us. Um, should be a, a kind of combination, hybrid, uh, interactive session, so we're um, looking forward to this. Um, we are here in Kyoto, and uh, we are joined by friends from around the world online. Um, I am Dan Arnato, a Senior Advisor for Information Strategies with the National Democratic Institute. We work globally uh, to observe elections, strengthen legislative processes, and support a more democratic information space, and that's uh, what we're here to talk about today. Um, this session was w specifically to discuss methods uh, of organizing to support a healthy information space, and particularly through um, our Infotegrity or Information Integrity Network, um, which is a group of organizations and individuals in Asia and from around the world that uh, work on these demo democratic and, and digital issues. Um, so to start, I'm going to talk a little bit about the network and uh, the session, and then we'll introduce some of my colleagues here. Um, who will talk about some of the resources from groups within the network, um, including from GovZero, which is a civic technology community in Taiwan, and uh, Pakistan's Digital Rights Foundation. Um, after uh, uh, you'll have an opportunity to ask some questions after that, and then we will move um, to breakout groups if uh, we have, uh, we're starting to get critical mass here, so uh, hopefully we will have uh, a good good turnout both online and in person. Um, and then uh, we will use this online brainstorm to discuss approaches to various aspects of internet governance and information integrity and that relationship. Um, and that will feed into our session report and, and our contributions. Um, so hopefully get some good feedback from you all. Um, so just to start with, I mean, in terms of our overall approach and, and infotegrity as a concept, um, we developed this as an initiative um, and uh, specifically to support the development of networks and training and, and other resources around um, informational issues. Um, and we have regional working groups on these issues that include technical policy and, and civic uh, organizations that collaborate and communicate on these issues. Um, and we, we, we really have a goal of building healthy information environments overall um, versus countering inauthentic information or um, harmful information. I think a lot of these uh, approaches that you hear talked about are often focusing only on countering disinformation or only on, um, you know, looking at influence campaigns. And I think, um, you know, it's more than that. It, it's, it's not only countering harmful content, but also about promoting uh, the flow of reliable information and, and building that healthy information environment that's that's layered on top of a lot of the the governance and infrastructure issues um, that are that are being discussed here. Um, from our perspective, effective democracies require that citizens have access to accurate and impartial electoral and political information in particular, and how that plays a role in those societies. Um, we consider critical stakeholders that we want to work with. So this is a component, I think, this group particularly focuses on civil society, but you also want to consider election management bodies, uh, the public sector, uh, governments, uh, mass media, I think certainly is play, playing a huge role, and, and obviously technology companies and, and social media in particular. Um, I think we, we really need to work collectively, and this is where kind of the, the word that's bandied about for the whole week is, is important in terms of multi-stakeholder engagement. I think in, in this case it is where we all have pieces of this. And it's not like a, a, a simple problem where one actor can unilaterally decide how things are gonna work. And, and, and despite, I think, the efforts of, of certain um, actors, uh, you know, particularly within the public sector, um, governments to, to reassert that control, it's something that is not gonna be simple to um, organize in that way because platforms and, and even we uh, within civil society, I think have a huge voice and role to play. Um, we must work in tandem, I think, to fight against uh, information manipulation campaigns that, that seek to set spread cynicism about democratic processes, uh, distort even people's basic concepts around institutions, and, and hinder citizens' abilities to make political decisions. Um, some of the approaches that, that we at NDI engage in through this initiative and, and Infotegrity Network um, include building on that knowledge base. How do we build resources? How do we create training materials, curricula? Uh, on these issues. Um, obviously, with, with, with us being a democratic organization, I think elections are a critical component of this, so we want to consider the elections monitoring piece, how do, how do elections happen online, how are they influenced, 
how can we monitor that and how can we help, help groups contribute to a more positive information environment in that sense. Um, and then I think a piece that is important here to think about is, is how do we build civic engagement and democratic uh, technology norms. So certainly here at IGF, I think this is one of the principal concepts that we're thinking about here uh, in terms of influencing normative ideas around how the internet should be governed, but also considering other mechanisms, the EU code of practice on disinformation, uh, national frameworks, even party frameworks, um, codes of conduct for diverse actors, whether you're a journalist, whether you're a member of a party, a political candidate, um, how are you approaching these issues and can we come to some agreement um, that, that will create stronger um, informational boundaries and, and understanding of what is acceptable for political speech within this space. I think we've had a lot of practice in time uh, establishing those normative standards around, say, traditional journalism standards or uh, traditional political campaigning standards, but we're still catching up, frankly, from the invention of the internet in terms of how political actors should operate online. Um, and then finally, I think we, we seek to, to really consider ways of addressing online violence against uh, women and, and other marginalized groups, gender disinformation, so that we can really build a healthy information space for all. Because I think uh, women and, and, and female candidates are often more targeted uh, by these practices. And so I think a lot of our programming and work integrates um, that, that idea and, and works to build systems to promote um, a, an open space that is um, open and accepting to, to diff different and diverse voices. Um, so you see we have a wide range of topic areas, um, advocacy, um, digital literacy, supporting marginalized groups. These are all kind of areas that we talk about within, within the network and, and want to focus on. The goal is to build societal resilience to, to harmful um, content, but also to um, promote uh, strong ideas that uh, promote a positive, open, free, rights-respecting, and, and democratic information environment, right? I think, you know, that's in the name of our organization and a lot of the groups we work with focus on this concept, but I think democratizing um, internet governance, democratizing the information space, um, and keeping it democratic and, and open um, is something that we really want to focus on. Um, this network um, that we've built is intended to be a, a coordination mechanism to help address these issues, um, and, and we're looking to discuss and, and demonstrate how it operates, specifically with this session and some of my colleagues here. Um, we have training and, and connection opportunities. We have roundtable discussions, um, particularly looking at elections and, and some of the topics I mentioned earlier. I think content moderation, challenges to research. These are some issues that we want to workshop on with you here as well in terms of understanding how you view these issues and how we can elevate them within the IGF community in different ways. So that'll be part of the breakouts and that, that component there. Um, we also have uh, discussions with guest speakers, whether they're tech companies, donors, um, research tool demos, and, and we have a couple people here um, in person today that are gonna give versions of that, talking about some of the resources they've developed. Um, also, if you're interested in joining going forward, you will have an opportunity to share your organization's contact information and, and request to join um, during this session. So to get started, I want to pass it on to my colleagues here. Um, we'd like to demonstrate some of the resources from um, the network and, and from, uh, from colleagues here from uh, Pakistan and Taiwan. Um, but to start, I have here uh, Dr. Keti Chen, um, who is the, the Taiwan country representative for uh, NDI and the head of its Taiwan office. Uh, prior to assuming her, her post, she served as the vice president of the Taiwan Foundation for Democracy from 2016 to 23, uh, 2023. So uh, please, uh, Katie, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Dan. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Katie Chen. Um, I am the new Taiwan representative for the National Democratic Institute's um, Taipei office. And it's really wonderful to be able to join all of you here um, to discuss some of these really important topics that Dan had mentioned. Um, as the um, NDI office in Taiwan, we um, work with uh, quite a few Taiwanese civil society members covering a series um, of different issues, um, such as media literacy, uh, information integrity, gender equality, um, LGBT rights, and also um, we work with Taiwanese civil societies and, and civil society in the region to secure um, and safeguard the basic rights of citizens. Um, not only um, the basic rights, but also their rights um, in the uh, internet space. 
Um, and we also have been um, creating network and alliances of civil society members in the region. So um, it's really important and, and I'm really grateful to be able to come here and continue um, networking and meeting new friends where in the future we can move forward um, into safeguarding some of these rights that Dan already uh, mentioned. So from the perspective um, of Taiwan, um, I would like to mention that um, under um, the UN system, it is um, not easy for Taiwanese civil society members uh, to join uh, forums like this um, because they have uh, difficulties register as uh, institutions uh, from Taiwan. If you recall when you have to pick um, where you're from um, on the drop down list, um, there's no uh, option of Taiwan. So um, just as um, the difficulty faced by uh, Taiwanese citizens, um, if you do not uh, click on the option of China, there is, um, uh, there's no um, options for them to be able to successfully complete registration. Um, so I'm actually very happy that we have um, a, a, a colleague from GovZero here on the panel. Um, and because as a result of these difficulties, um, quite a few, actually the majority of Taiwanese civil society organizations uh, in Taiwan who work on, uh, who are from the civic tech community, um, uh, civil society members that work on countering uh, information warfare and disinformation, um, they're not physically here uh, today. So I think for us, it would be very useful um, to leave our contact information with you um, or for you to leave your contact information with us. So moving forward, we could pass on the information uh, from your organizations and the issues that you're interested in working with Taiwanese civil society on so we could move forward um, after um, this uh, really important um, forum. And um, just a little bit about uh, disinformation and information warfare campaign um, from China targeted in Taiwan. Um, uh, unfortunately, but also it is uh, fortunate that Taiwan um, has been in the past decade the number one uh, number one country in the world that's been uh, under uh, the distribution of disinformation from an entity outside of Taiwan or a foreign uh, country. But because of that, uh, Taiwanese civil society organizations, they work amongst themselves to develop strategies to counter um, not only information warfare campaign, but also the authoritarian's intrusion on uh, how to affect Taiwan's um, democracy. For example, we are right smack in the middle of um, the national campaign uh, of 2024. Um, I think in one of the um, uh, panels yesterday, um, I think Dan, you were on there, um, that next year is going to be uh, a very busy year for um, Democrats like us because there's several important national elections happening around the world, and Taiwan is one of them. Um, and so what Taiwanese civil society had developed is that they have strategies of publishing reports, um, and especially bilingual reports on the behavior of disinformation, targeting election, or even between elections. And also um, the civil societies convened um, together to create civ uh, civil civic tech groups to try to bridge um, the Taiwanese citizens and its government and bring, bring on um, issues that it's uh, that's important for citizens to discuss amongst themselves and then reflect um, to government uh, officials. So um, I, I think that it's it's rather um, amazing that civil society in Taiwan, upon arriving at critical junctures of political history within uh, the country, that um, they uh, always manage to come up with strategies and plans that works to uh, safeguard Taiwan's democracy. And also they're very eager to share that with partners uh, from the region and from around the world. Um, so I think I will pass the mic um, to um, Isabel, who is a representative of GovZero. And she has developed a civic tech handbook um, to share with um, people who are interested and using the Taiwan model. So um, I'll give the floor to her. Thank you, Kathy. 
Uh, it's my great pleasure to be here. And first, let me uh, share my screen. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Oh, great. you get it. Okay, great. Okay. Um, I'm Isabel Ho. I'm a lawyer, and uh, I contribute to Gap Zero community in the past 10 years. But, however, I'm not the representative of uh, Gap Zero community because it is a decentralized community, and it's uh, difficult to say someone can represent this community. But I was um, a chairperson of a very important task force uh, in Gap Zero uh, community, which uh, uh, organized uh, by monthly hack zone in the past uh, 10 years. Um, uh, so I'm also the Secretary General of Taiwan AI Ac uh, Ac Academy Foundation. Um, so what is uh, Gap Zero? Um, actually, it's a group of people who uh, has uh, like two, uh, two jobs. One is a regular job, and the other one is um, they use their free time, like Saturday and the Sunday, and maybe after work to t contribute to the pr uh, community projects. It's a, it is a decentralized uh, civic tech commun community. Uh, we advocate the transparency of information and the build tech solutions for citizens to participate in public affair from the bottom up. So. Um, Gov zero means uh, substituting the zero, uh, the O with zero in Gov. We want to use the uh, internet and digital thinking, zero and uh, one, to change the traditional government. And um, it's kind of like a, a concept of nerd politics. So it's a, a group of people. Uh, many of them come from the background of computing, law, media, arts, pol uh, politics. And they work in teams, and this small team uh, group of uh, team members mobilize a crowd. They provide the tools to invite people to more people to join their actions. Um, in the GovZero manifesto, um, there we share the core value of this community. Uh, it's a um, we come from everywhere. We are citizens co collaborating to bring about change. We are polycentric. Uh, community and uh, so self-organized and uh, um, motivated. And we use an uh, open source uh, model to try to find a solution for challenges uh, of society. And we have fun because we you need to have fun to, to, man to do this for 10 years and to change the status quo. And we are you. You can just uh, click um, join the Slack. Um, so it's a state um, a dashboard of the Gov Zero. Um, um, in the yesterday morning, we have uh, more than thirteen thousand people in the Slack users. They come from many different parts of um, uh, the world, including Silicon Valley. Um, I think we have um, uh, pa participants from um, many parts of Asia, and we have hosted. Uh, 58 ha uh, hexons and um, almost uh, 1,000 proposals. And we celebrated one tenth anniversary last year. And so this is the uh, background of uh, Gov Zero participants. Um, there are many engineers, they coding, and we also have students called learning together and the NGO organizers, uh, educators, writers, designers, uh, lawyers like me and journalists. So um, these are three keywords of the Gov Zero participant. There's a big uh, part of Python, but there are also iOS design, um, project man management, backend blockchain. So it's um, in the Gov Zero, I think it's not a multi-stakeholder forum. It's kind of like a um, platform for multi stake collaboration. You can collaborate with people from many different kind, uh, kind, kinds of backgrounds. Um, so it's a short, uh, very short um, introduction about Gap Zero. Um, if you are interested, interested, you can find this uh, online. Uh, I shared the 10 years of Odyssey uh, of Gap Zero uh, last year in Open Source Summit. Um, it's an open source beyond code development. It's a, a 
experiments to use open source model to solve the social issues. I think that works. And um, so um, about uh, information integrity, as uh, Katie just mentioned, Taiwan faced this kind of challenge very, very early. Like in, before, uh, er, in 2013, we have this project called News Helper. It's a small program which you can just uh, add it in your computer, then it will uh, remind you if this news is uh, skeptical. And in 2016, um, there's another project called CoFact. It's a line bot, which will, uh, you can add it in your line application, and then uh, you forward the skeptical uh, information to the bot. And there are group of uh, community members there to do the fact-checking things for you. And in 2020, we have this, uh, in the community, there is a proposed uh, project called the Zero Archive. And uh, the project owner is here, Zhi Hao. And I think this um, project is to um, try to collect a, a lot of, uh, systematically to collect a, a lot of um, uh, data on the web and to try to figure out uh, the information environment in a much more large uh, context. And this um, project is uh, sponsored by, I think, uh, NDI and those other uh, institutions. And so um, this year, um, Zhi Hao's uh, organization, IORG, they um, de um, deliver a report about this um, uh, narrative, uh, US uh, skepticism narratives and uh, where they come from. They, they, so it's not only about a certain individual con disinformation content, but now we are looking more like how they try to manip manipulate the whole uh, public discourse in Taiwan. And uh, the report is um, um, adopted by um, economist uh, uh, last month to report uh, how China is uh, flu uh, flooding Taiwan with um, disinformation. So these are some of projects about um, um, info integrity in our community. And um, now I want to uh, share with um, uh, you our uh, summary of how we do this uh, different, different kind of projects. Um, so you can scan the uh, QR code, it's online, and uh, you can just, uh, it's uh, still in progress, but uh, with the open source spirit, we release early, we re release often, so um, you can just check it. Check it. Um, and in the uh, handbook, we just uh, uh, analyze um, the different stage and uh, the flow of the how the project can be um, built up. Uh, from come up, come up with ideas and um, what kind of uh, resources and checkpoints you should uh, notice. And uh, it's it is very important to have a good English name so you can share with uh, people who don't know uh, Chinese, Chinese and uh, what kind of things you should do. And uh, uh, try to find the fundings and um, so it's um, um, and and then you can release uh, your results. Um, we do this uh, in the community and by hosting a uh, bi-monthly hackathon. People are not only collaborate online, they can come to uh, the same place to do face-to-face -face discussion. I think this is a very important thing to do. Uh, so people get, get connected when they talk uh, in person. And Except this, we also uh, analyze the elements of um, what should be included in this um, uh, go in this Zero community. First, you need contributors. Uh, you need people who are willing to contribute, and you create a, a space for them to collaborate together. The space could be a physical space, but also online space, like uh, providing collaboration uh, tools online. And uh, then people will propose, uh, bring their own proposal and create a repos. Um, then invite people to join their uh, project with the results of uh, like source code or documentation. This will empower the contributors to do more, more con uh, contributions. 
I think these are the uh, important elements of, of Gov Zero community. And in the content um, chapter one, we share how what is Gov Zero, how Gov Zero works, and um, also in chapter two, we uh, share about how to build up a community. And uh, I think you might want to check, check uh, chapter three first because we have a, a lot of uh, different cases here. And then, um, like this is uh, um, the COFACT uh, project, uh, project I just mentioned. Um, it analyzes the backgrounds of project owners and how they um, set up the goals of the project and uh, the complexity, modularization, digitalization, and how open it, I it is. We have several, um, ten, more than 10 uh, project cases in the handbook. And also with the uh, NDI sponsor, we share the draft of this handbook with uh, um, communities in uh, Southeast Asia, in Chiang Mai this uh, last May, and also with uh, um, Japan and Korean community uh, in Jeju Island. Uh, and then we collect a lot of uh, cases how the, um, the current status of civic tech projects and community around Asia countries. So I think this might be very inform uh, informative for all of you. And this is my sharing and uh, thank you. Thanks, thanks very much, Isabel. Very interesting. Thank you, um, and I think um, finally we're going to move to um, our uh, final speaker here, um, Hira Bassett, who is a senior program manager at the Digital Rights Foundation uh, in Pakistan and oversees the cyber harassment helpline there and uh, gender disinformation projects and another critical election uh, coming up in the next year. So over to you. Hi everyone. Um, yeah, as Dan said, my name is Hayar Basit. I'm here from Digital Rights Foundation in Pakistan. And um, regarding the, right, uh, we've done a lot of work um, regarding information integrity. And I'm just going to give you like a brief overview of everything that we've done. So it's just a uh, bits and pieces of you know a lot of our projects. So uh, just starting off. Um, um, in 2016, we started the Cyber Harassment Helpline, which came about as a response to a lot of complaints and cases that we were receiving from young girls and women. Um, and we saw that there was no uh, real awareness or support system that they had. And so this the helpline came about as a um, solution uh, or a potential solution, actually, to um, you know all of the complaints that we were getting. Um, there was a, a space, a gap that we saw, and we tried to fill it as best as we could. So uh, the helpline has been... Um, uh, been established since 2016, um, and we provide um, digital security services, psychological or mental health support um, to women, uh, to women and young girls, especially because it's such a taboo topic to be facing online harassment of any sort, um, of you know facing tech-facilitated gender-based violence, of intimate image abuse, um, if their if their accounts are hacked or, f or if they're being impersonated. It's such a taboo that you cannot talk to your friends and family about this, um, or you're going to be victim blamed. Um, uh, the other thing that we do is we provide legal services. So we uh, we actually do have a uh, prevention, the Prevention of Electronic Crimes Act in Pakistan, which addresses cyber crimes. Uh, part of which is um, y abusing or harassing women. Um, it doesn't cover everything, but it covers it does cover some of it. So our um, uh, um, our uh, aim is to provide pro bono legal services or legal awareness and legal knowledge to everyone who calls us. Um, but since then, our you know it started out as a focus on women and girls, but since then we have expanded our services or uh, we've concentrated some of our services rather to focus on. Um, providing services to vulnerable vulnerable occupations, uh, particularly journalists and human rights defenders. Um, so uh, in, in, that, uh, in that goal, um, we establish escalation channels with social media platforms in order to directly raise uh, those cases to them um, and bridge the gap between um, you know, Western or Global North social media and tech companies and the kind of context or regional problems that we see in Pakistan or, uh, you know, generally in the Global South. Um, we see that there is no real understanding of why their policies don't really work for us 
necessarily in Pakistan um, and how or their implementation rather and so what needs to be done to in order to um, actively address the kinds of uh, problems that we're seeing or the kinds of uh, or the solutions that we need um, so again for uh, journalists and human rights defenders we take those cases as a priority um, we try to uh, flag them especially you know and this includes uh, meta Twitter or X TikTok, uh, Google um, these are all platforms that are very actively being used for uh, by journalists and human rights defenders um, to spread or actually uh, you know, build their professional capacities or uh, reach out to their audiences. Um, but in addition to this, we have also started to focus particularly on disinformation. Um, we have our elections coming up and we've seen in the past that uh, disinformation campaigns have been actually prevalent and very successful in, um, creative, uh, in creating mass um, unrest and protests. Um, as well as um, sometimes even slightly affecting legal changes. Um, um, these disinformation campaigns have targeted uh, women journalists in particular um, and, uh, you know, and everything that comes along with it, you know, sexualizing them, uh, focusing on their um, trying to discredit them as journalists, but also women or, you know, their, uh, their personal integrity. Um, and we've also seen uh, a, very, a very strong, a very recent example um, of these disinformation campaigns targeting the transgender community in Pakistan. Um, that we worked very hard uh, with social media companies, especially Meta, to you know address these. Um, I won't go into much detail about you know our engagement with them. Um, I get very angry when I start to think about how unresponsive they were in the big or even now. Um, but you know uh, it's something that you know we have to keep highlighting with uh, uh, social media companies um, because it, it just seems like they don't really want to focus or it's not, you know, the global south or Pakistan isn't really like a focus area for them. Um, and so we have to keep on providing them with evidence or, you know, um, sort of show um, a consistent pattern or uh, consequences in the offline world for them to actually take those cases seriously. Um, so again, about disinformation, um, that's something that because we have seen in the past, um, because we have seen active campaigns in the past, um, very coordinated campaigns, uh, mostly primarily that focus um, on, uh, uh, you know, in online spaces and using social media companies. Uh, WhatsApp, I forgot, is one of the most, um, you know, prevalently used uh, platform as well. Um, it's not a social media company, it's still a messaging platform, but still it's something that's very widely used. Um, but because of this, we know that with the upcoming elections, it's just going to um, increase. We're very um, apprehensive about, you know, the kind of uh, disinformation that it's going to be spreading, um, particularly again, uh, particularly gender disinformation and how it might affect, uh, how it might not just sway the elections, um, but also um, bring certain individuals or communities to harm. Um, so uh, to address these problems, uh, what we have done is, you know, we were trying uh, to um, highlight these, uh, you know, this as a very strong um, topic or a focus in um, to uh, with the journalist community. So we're we're conducting diligent trainings all over the country with not just uh, you know mainstream media personalities, but also local journalists uh, who work in local languages. Um, you know, print, media, um, print, broadcast, um, online, local uh, online journalists, everyone. Uh, we try and engage with them in order to build their capacity for fact checking. Uh, well, first of all, actually, to bring into their consciousness that disinformation is a thing, um, that is something that they need to be aware of, and they need to actively. Um, bring media ethics into uh, or address media ethics whenever they're doing their work because it seems like even that isn't something that they're aware of. Um, you know, some local, uh, some journalists work at such grassroots level that it's not like they've had very extensive training that they went to you know, university for it. Um, sometimes they just start working when they're like teenagers. Or uh, so it's not, sometimes it's not just in their, um, daily practice. So that's something that we try to uh, bring to uh, bring into focus for them. Um, and we try to um, uh, give them trainings um, that address uh, digital security, that address media ethics, 
um, and a, f a focus on fact checking, what they can do, what tools they can use, and um, you know, differentiating or um, addressing disinformation, misinformation, malinformation, not just within um, their own, you know, if they're freelancers, not just within their community, but also, you know, to their uh, wider media groups. Because sometimes it seems like it, it's not really a focus for them because it's not what brings in the money, you know, to, uh, to be addressing these sorts of small issues. Um, and uh, our, our aim is also to bridge the gap between local media and social media companies. So we actually try to uh, actively engage. Uh, we try to you know, bring each other's complaints forward. Um, uh, and um, again, like I said before, it, it sometimes it seems like they don't want to pay, uh, you know, social media companies or tech platforms don't really want to pay attention um, to smaller countries like Pakistan. And so we try to bridge that gap between, um, so that there's no, um, they th so that it doesn't seem like uh, civil society organizations or DRF is uh, just making things up, that they get to hear from actual individuals on the ground about how um, their policies or how they're implemented affect their daily work um, and sometimes even their personal security. Um, we've also developed uh, many toolkits um, that again focus on the same about addressing disinformation, about the tools that they can use, about digital security, because it seems because it is a fact that you know digital security can play a very integral part in um, um, inform in information integrity, I guess, um, and uh, you know securing themselves online in order to be able to do their work even better. Um, but we also recognize that, you know, within all these trainings, there is also, or within the, um, when we're talking about disinformation, um, we, uh, we sometimes forget to address mental health concerns, um, especially with, uh, again, you know, local reporters and journalists, um, especially uh, communities and individuals that face gender disinformation um, within a very um, conservative environment like Pakistan. So we have also developed mental health tools toolkits um, in order to address those um, those concerns. Our helpline also particularly focuses on um, trying to offer psychosocial support, um, even sometimes when people don't feel like they need it, because again, it's just something that, you know, our, our people aren't very used to, you know, asking for, you know, asking for support or asking for, you know, I'm not feeling well. It's just not something that people are used to saying. Um, I think that's about it. Um, we've also been working on gender disinformation, but uh, our, our research is ongoing, so I don't know how much, uh, how relevant it would be to talk about that right now. Um, but, you know, we've been trying to engage with social media companies to address the gender disinformation, that cases that we've received, uh, which has been in the hundreds over the past year. Like I said, uh, there was a whole online campaign against the transgender community in Pakistan. Uh, we had some success with that. Um, but our research in particular is still ongoing. So we, uh, I, I think we had, we were, I was attending a session in the morning and uh, some of the things that they were saying was that, you know, there's not enough research to identify whether disinformation um, is, is harming democracy. Um, and so uh, we hope to actually address some of those, you know, key answers. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Ira. Um, so I think, um, given we're a little bit behind schedule and I want to have time for everyone to um, contribute um, to the breakout sessions. I think we have a good critical mass here so we can do this properly. Um, we wanted to get your feedback on a couple of different issues um, for our contribution. Um, first of all, um, you know, if you would like to join um, you know, the network, um, this is a Jamboard. Um, I'm going to share it here on the screen briefly and then I'll put up a QR code um, so you can take a look and, and get a sense of uh, how this works yourself. Um, but we'll do physical breakouts here, and then, um, and then um, there will be a virtual one for folks online if you want to contribute. We have uh, our colleague Sirat from Pakistan who is online there. Um, but basically, we're going to break into four groups. Um, to start with, I think, you know, if you would like to, um, you know, share, uh, I think, is that up on the screen or no? I shared it in the uh, Zoom chat. Um, oh, there you go. Um, yeah, if you'd like to just drop um, your, your name in, um, you know, you can drop it in there, name an organization, um, an email, um, and um, we can, um, if, you, if you would like to join the network, just mark it with an X. Um, then from there, I mean, this is what we're going to be breaking out on. 
I think we wanted to look at closed societies um, and challenges working on those issues there. Um, so that would be uh, one piece of it. Um, another piece uh, to discuss in breakout would be looking at social media, uh, data access for research. So challenges within social media companies, um, how we can develop uh, systems um, or resources for groups that want to get into those, uh, th those social media uh, spaces that are increasingly restricted. Um, kind of related, uh, some of what we've been talking about, coordination um, with technology platforms around trust and safety concerns. Um, internet governance for uh, information integrity, obviously critical for, for this um, area here. Um, so we're all gonna be uh, moderating each of these breakouts here. Um, I think um, within the room, uh, maybe we can split, have, um, let's see here, to start with um, the, the four kind of groups um, within the session kind of go to separate corners, um, depending on what you're interested in. Um, so let's start, um, I think um, we have, Ketty, you're gonna be talking about closed societies, so maybe start here if you're interested in discussing that. Um, platforms and tech company issues, maybe here. Hira is gonna discuss that. Um, Isabel um, will be enabling research access, maybe in the back right-hand corner there. Um, and then uh, I'll go to the back left-hand corner and discuss uh, internet governance and information integrity. And we'll share the QR code and the link in the chat for those online um, who would like to um, participate. And, and we have a moderator there. Um, so we will be there in uh, a minute. Let's just reorganize and then we'll come back for five minutes for summaries. Um, yeah, it's tough. I think, yeah, we'll maybe like 13, something like that, and try to come back with at least two or three minutes. No, we, we got like two minutes, so let's just. Okay, everybody, uh, the moderators, come on back up. Um, we can summarize. Um, I guess um, I'll go backwards since I have the mic um, and just summarize quickly and then pass to my fellow moderators um, of the breakout so we can quickly summarize. If you want to jump into the Jamboard um, and plus one certain aspects or add new ones that came up came to your mind afterwards, feel free. We'll p pop up the QR code quickly um, or share it in the chat. Um, but I mean, I think around internet governance for, for information integrity, we're looking at um, multi-stakeholder approaches, um, you know, as, as we've kind of been discussing already, I think, um, particularly around information integrity issues. Um, we were thinking about tools for enabling access for people with disabilities to access these debates and developing strategies for um, local internet governance coordination on, on disinformation issues. Um, and I think, um, you know, thinking about kind of a human rights approach um, on these issues, we're looking at kind of um, how training uh, for different aspects or, or different groups within societies would look like. Um, how can we build trust within the election process? And we even had a, a, an additional piece looking at what are the missing technology pieces in elections and an additional question that came around that we were kind of uh, working on some. So thinking about systems outside of uh, the traditional information space, um, systems for tracking uh, disinformation efforts outside of the internet and, and thinking about um, digital ID and systems for, for verifying people within elections processes. Um, maybe over to you for the next quick review. Yeah. That one, right? That one, yeah. Um, okay, I can't read that anyway. So uh, we started off our discussion with, um, we had uh, participants from, again, Pakistan, the US, um, uh, Netherlands, Iraq, and yeah, I think that's about, and Japan, yes. Um, so we talked about, you know, the kind of platforms that we've been using in our respective countries and um, WhatsApp, X, Instagram um, were some of the top ones, but we also talked about uh, TikTok and Line um, being used to um, disseminate information, especially um, in the context of, you know, more uh, um, integral moments like elections. Um, then we talked about, uh, we sort of diverted from the discussion a bit a few times, but, um, uh, we were uh, 
uh, talked a bit about how to better engage with uh, tech platforms and what has worked for us before, um, how we do it currently in the, uh, you know, in our respective situations. Um, and uh, y again, it's it seemed like uh, the escalation channels that we've established with them sometimes they work, sometimes not. There's all there's they're not completely perfect. There are loopholes to them, or there are uh, gaps that that need to be filled out, and there needs to be more engagement. But the kind of engagement that we've seen with those platforms um, uh, sort of depend on either personal connections or uh, individual employees' uh, willingness to actually connect with CSOs or like in organizations like ours. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that's all. Okay, here, um, um, tools and strategy uh, to use to monitor information. There is a pay to gather information, social engineering, build up your own system, um, and share the data sets with, data sets with other researchers. And uh, according to the pa participants' experiences, TikTok and Douyin has the most strong mechanism to prevent crowder and access to <coughs> to their data, de data. And the resources of way is we want to share uh, is uh, data sets and also the experiences of uh, uh, handling this, uh, this kind of issue and also maybe some comparison of historical data would be uh, very useful. Okay. Yeah. Very quickly, um, uh, engaging in um, civil society organization and closed societies can be done. Um, however, it is um, more feasible at the regional level, but when it comes to globally, it really takes time for different regions to understand the working of these closed society and how um, to get in touch with each other. And also, um, cybersecurity is really important for these civil society groups. Um, there are Taiwanese organizations that could help um, improve the cybersecurity of these groups so that working in close society um, it's more feasible and easier. Great, so we got a lot of feedback.